a talk by Jamie Morrison, applies to this slide, the University of Washington. Jamie's been a, an Arctic physical oceanographer for a long time. He goes back to Ice Island T3, and those of you who know your Arctic science history will know that that's going back right away. So, Jamie's still very active in Arctic physical oceanography research. And uh, in recent years, a lot of that effort has been focused on the North Pole Environmental Observatory and uh, his use of the U.S. Coast Guard Arctic Domain Awareness Flight that began back in 2009, I think. Jamie will correct that, I'm sure. And uh, since 2012, um, the level of effort of Jamie and others' involvement in the Coast Guard Awareness Flight has, um, has picked up with, uh, thanks to ONR support, um, of atmospheric and uh, ocean sounding. And so I'm very pleased to, to introduce Jamie today to tell us more about what is, over the years, uh, going back to the North Pole Environmental Observatory that began 10, 12 or more years ago, perhaps, um, very much an interagency effort, primarily through the efforts of Jamie. It's another good example, I think, of how our principal investigators they make the agencies look good in terms of interagency collaboration because they bring together awards, grants, and contracts from different agencies to build programs like you're about to hear. So without further ado, uh, Jamie, the floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to push the share my desktop button. And Jamie, before you get started, I just want to remind everybody to please go to mute so we can cut down on background noise. Thank you. Okay, can, uh, are people hearing me now? Yep, you sound loud and clear, Jamie. Okay, whoops. Let's get something out of the way here. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you, Martin. That pretty well describes uh, what you're in for. Um, this whole idea started off with uh, actually a comment that uh, Ignatius Rigger made uh, after we completed this flight of uh, the Coast Guard C-130 uh, to the North Pole. And he, he said, geez, you know, there's all kinds of agencies represented in this. And so we kind of started toting it up. And uh, the, the line you see across the bottom uh, is, is sort of represents the, the number of agencies that helped uh, get that uh, airplane off the ground for this trip. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, Renee Crane thought that would be a nice topic for uh, for the for this webinar. Uh, as I as I uh, thought about it, I thought, well, really to understand why we were doing it, you really needed to go back a little bit, talk about the North Pole Environmental Observatory and, and why we were trying to get to the place we were. And uh, and I realized that uh, really those the, the things that led up to this go back 15 years. And um, really to understand it, you need to kind of understand that progression. and. The important thing is that it involves uh, interagency uh, collaboration, basically kind of at the PI level. But but I, I guess the message I also wanted to get out there was that um, how fantastic I think that the progress we've made in observing the ocean has been over the last 15 years uh, compared to where we were back in uh, 2000 and what we have now. It's just fantastic, and it's really because of uh, because of all the different agencies that have contributed to it, contributing the part that they they typically do best. And so, anyway, I I'm fully intend this to be kind of a thing that will make you feel good when you when you get off the off the webinar. Uh, I'll start off with uh, the background. Uh, August 2015, we made the flight of. Uh, C-130, number 1711, to the North Pole, and it's really just the latest effort uh, to get out there in an unusual time, in an unusual place, um, 
that really are the, the access issues of, of uh, understanding how the Arctic Ocean behaves. And uh, so let's kind of come to what the, the old classic view has been. Uh, basically, the Arctic Ocean is an ice factory and uh, a place where it's made, and it's a mixing bowl for Atlantic water, which comes in from through Fram Strait, Bering Sea, uh, excuse me, Bering, Bering Sea, and, uh, and Pacific water, which comes in through Bering Strait. Uh, and its circulation's typically been categorized uh, really almost since the time of Nansen as a as a anticyclonic or, or clockwise circulation uh, that we refer to as the Beaufort Gyre and a transpolar drift that takes ice and, and water uh, out through Fram Strait. And I was I was a little bit surprised when I saw the old classic view showing up in a very recent uh, workshop report. Um, for a study of Arctic and, and North Atlantic interaction, and uh, they showed that same classic pattern uh, with a giant Beaufort gyre up there in the in the Arctic Ocean and a transpolar drift sort of feeding into the into the North Atlantic. And you would have thought, well, this is a very artistic drawing, and it may be an artist's rendition, but uh, the uh, the science plan text says uh, basically an anticyclonic circulation regime has dominated in this region for the past 16 years, intensifying the buildup of fresh water in the gyre. And uh, while that's uh, partly true uh, for parts of the Arctic Ocean, I think as a general statement, it's it's not true. Um, and uh, and, and the reason goes back to this thinking in terms of um, cyclonic versus anti-cyclonic circulation regime. And the first good reference to this is a review paper by uh, Sokolov, dated 1962, uh, a Russian publication in, in English. And it summarizes, uh, it's a review basically of what a lot of uh, people in Russia put into this uh, subject. But basically, it says that there is this anti-cyclonic mode where you have a giant Beaufort gyre and a transpolar drift that simply goes out through through uh, Fram Strait, and that's kind of the whole picture. And then there's another circulation regime called the anti-cyclonic, or excuse me, the cyclonic regime, which is a counterclockwise circulation appears over on the Russian side of the Arctic. So the, the clockwise business in the Beaufort Sea stays there, but it gets a little smaller. The, the front and transpolar drift, um, they shift a little bit in a counterclockwise way. And now we have a counterclockwise circulation over on the other side. So that uh, anticyclonic circulation is, uh, is really the appearance of a whole different mode of uh, operation. It's characterized Instead of a monopole, we have sort of a dipole. And in the early 90s, Jamie, Jamie, it's Martin. Can I just interrupt briefly and ask people to mute themselves, please? Yeah, we're hearing a little bit of the background noise that's interfering with your talk. Okay. So I go ahead. <laughs> yes, Jamie, please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, we saw a shift from this uh, the standard anticyclonic mode to the cyclonic mode. And it was, it was uh, you could see the variations uh, between the two modes as evidenced in uh, data in the U.S. Russian climatology that characterizes the RMS variability and salinity uh, in this case in the in the decade of the 70s. Uh, that's on the right side of the figure. And here you're looking down in a perspective view into the Arctic Ocean from up over Russia, and you see that this region that uh, is basically over the Makarov Basin uh, was the region of highest variability. Then in 1993, when we measured 
salinity structure in this in this pattern you see the, the curtain through the Arctic Ocean. We saw on the top 200 meters that the salinity had increased quite a bit in the uh, Makarov Basin, about two parts per thousand, and that basically was because the front between Atlantic-derived and Pacific-derived waters had shifted in this counterclockwise way. And this is characteristic of that of that, cy that uh, cyclonic mode of, of circulation when you get that shift in the front. And what it did was it suggested that we sample the hydrography in the central Arctic Ocean if we were going to track the cyclonic versus anticyclonic circulation regime. We could get up there, uh, in, in our case, at the North Pole and keep track of how that salinity varied. That would be one indicator of, uh, of whether we were in one regime or another. And so uh, all of these changes, there were a lot of other changes that occurred in the early 90s, and, um, and they motivated search and uh, development of the Arctic Observing Network. Uh, and the Arctic Observing Network has included the Beaufort Gyre Exploratory Project, uh, the Nansen Amundsen Basin Observing System, the Switchyard Program down in the Lincoln Sea, and the North Pole Environmental Observatory. And they have all these different operations use slightly different techniques, but uh, NPO includes. Uh, the installation every April of uh, automated drifting stations near the North Pole. We typically work out of a Russian uh, tourist camp that's put out near the pole, and they'll we'll, we'll put out uh, buoys, uh, drifting buoys at other locations. We've maintained a mooring near the pole. Uh, actually, right now, the mooring consists of, a, of an ocean bottom pressure recorder, uh, basically exactly at the North Pole. And uh, a big part of our project is to fly around in a twin otter aircraft equipped with skis, lands on the ice, and we do basically old-fashioned hydrographic stations doing water chemistry and CTD and um, velocity shear uh, measurements to, to estimate mixing. Uh, and we also, as part of those, put out uh, buoys at various locations through the basin. So we tend to kind of cover this, this area north of 85 um, it, uh, NPO spawned a switchyard, so the switchyard program comes up uh, from alert and makes uh, similar measurements by twin otter aircraft up to the pole. And in, in recent years, we, as I'll show, we've started going down 90 east with the idea of, uh, again, trying to track these longer term changes. Uh, in 2008, it was IPY, and so we expanded uh, the operation. We wanted to get, in this case, the, the goal was to go down in the Beaufort Sea and get some springtime measurements. Typically, um, in the summertime, ships can go into the, into the Beaufort Sea pretty easily, and there's a lot of ship traffic doing oceanographic measurements. But that kind of gives you the picture at the end of summertime after the ice is melted and so forth. And to get the opposite extreme, we wanted to get down there in, in springtime and it still had the result of, of the winter freeze up and uh, be able to compare winter and spring conditions. But this uh, figure that you're seeing is a contour plot of dynamic heights. Uh, and surface geostrophic current from those dynamic heights, uh, currents relative to 500 decibars. And, and this is the kind of classic way of doing oceanography um, to uh, basically take hydrographic measurements, measure density, assume that the velocity is zero down at some level of no motion, in this case a depth of 500 decibars, close to 500 meters. And, and then you sort of back figure what the, what the pressure distribution is on the way up and including figuring out from the, from the density or, or specific volume what the height of the sea surface is relative to the geoid. And, and so that has for years given us our ideas of what the surface circulation was. 
And uh, what you see is, is the classic picture. I mean, there's a big, strong Beaufort gyre, and we could look at the water properties and compare it to previous times and see that, yeah, there had been a big buildup of fresh water in, in the Beaufort Sea. But uh, this really isn't the whole picture. Because when we did the hydrochemistry, uh, Matt Alkire is our, is our chemist, and, and uh, he, uh, from the water chemistry, can estimate what the components of the fresh water are that are mixed into the upper part of the ocean. And the finding was that uh, that, that was mainly due to Eurasian runoff. Now, the Eurasian runoff starts over in the in the Laptev Sea and, and in the Obe Kara Sea and the Obe and Yenisei rivers. And so the big question is, well, how does it get over there? And uh, you can't really answer that question with this with this data set. Anyway, so the, the other issue is that you can look at this and you say, well, there's most of the ocean is not sampled. So we've got this very narrow picture. So again, it's the problem of, of expanding measurements. And, in this case, remote sensing comes to our rescue. And in, in, in particular, uh, ISAT uh, is an altimeter that uh, is expired now. Uh, we're working on ISAT too, but, but ISAT's an altimeter, and Ron Kwok uh, at, uh, at Jet Propulsion Lab figured out how to uh, look at the ISAT data, and it's a, it's a LIDAR, uh, so it's measuring laser light returns and get those off of the leads out in the sea ice and thereby estimate sea surface height. And dynamic ocean topography, which is really the true surface of the ocean that drives currents, uh, is that sea surface height measured in leads uh, with uh, the geoid uh, elevation extracted. The other big tool um, is the GRACE satellite system. And GRACE measures uh, gravity, but the changes in gravity yield the changes in ocean mass or, or ocean bottom pressure. And if we take those two two measurements, if we if we measure the height of the sea surface basically, and we measure the change in weight, we can basically estimate the average density of the seawater. And from that, we've developed a little technique to calculate the amount of fresh water that's, that's mixed into the Arctic Ocean. I, now this is where we we really see we start to see the connection between in this case the agency NASA and the and NSF because the ground truth for dynamic ocean topography is as I described earlier the dynamic height that you get at particular points where you make a hydrographic profile so the two should give you about the same answer uh, the the ground truth for ocean bottom pressure. Uh, comes from gauges like our North Pole Arctic Bottom Pressure Recorder, and it's. it's I'm not going to go into the the uh, the uh, bottom pressure part of this connection, but I think uh, one of the most exciting things I've had seen as as we've been doing this work is the is the good correspondence we can get between the, the NSF picture at, at a particular point. And, and the remote sensing picture we can get, which we can then extrapolate to the whole Arctic Ocean. And here we'll show an extrapolation uh, to the whole Arctic Ocean, where we've, we've added the, the information from ISAT. Uh, on the left was the picture from basic hydro hydrography, from a bunch of CDE stations measured with our aircraft and with the ice tethered profilers. And on the right, you see the dynamic ocean topography from, from ISAT for that same time period in 2008. And the, and the big thing that, that pops out at you is that while you just get this very anti-cyclonic domed sea surface picture, if you just look at the hydrography and the places to which we have access, you get one completely different picture. When you can look at the whole ocean, you see what, well, lo and behold, there's also this trough in in the surface that's kind of aligned along the Russian side of the Arctic. And so, to me, this really is 
strong indication that at this time it was in this cyclonic mode that's in the Sokolov paper with a, with a uh, uh, counterclockwise circulation on the Russian side and a strong clock, uh, counter, sorry, sorry, clockwise circulation on, on the, uh, in the Beaufort Sea. Uh, and I will point out that we got good agreement here between the dynamic ocean topography and from ISAP and, uh, and where we could where we could do the comparison at the hydro station. There's a strong agreement between the dynamic height from the oceanography and the, and the dynamic ocean topography from the satellite. Uh, this is the shows the trend from 2005 to 2008. And one might ask, well, okay, if people are saying that it's mostly anticyclonic, did that is that maybe just 2008 was just a particular year? Well, really, 2008 was the culmination of a progression. And so this shows the trend in dynamic ocean topography. And uh, what we see is, again, a, an increase in the height of the Beaufort Gyre. So it indeed became stronger and uh, more anticyclonic. But at the same time, we saw an increasingly cyclonic circulation on the on the right side of the figure over along the Russian coast. So in my view, this means it became more towards the cyclonic mode of, of circulation. Now, again, here is, we can also see the comparison because what we've plotted as contours are just uh, the dynamic topography from ISAP. But those little triangles, those take uh, great bottom pressure. So now we're taking another satellite and we we subtract off the effect of density change at the hydrographic stations for which we have repeat stations. You'll see clustered around the North Pole, there are a number of triangles. That's because North Pole Environmental Observatory, funded by uh, NSF, made those repeat stations for several years. And we also have the same thing up in the Beaufort for the, the BGAP stations. And so here we're comparing kind of one satellite with a combination of satellite data from GRACE and, and in situ hydrographic data that came out of the NSF program. And we get really good agreement. In a lot of those triangles, it's pretty hard to even pick them out. Uh, we're getting the same trends in, uh, in this, basically the high level sea surface. The other important thing is that if you look at the little arrows, the trends in the in the velocity, you see that along the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean, there's an alongshore eastward motion to the water, and, and that, that carries uh, Eurasian runoff all the way over into the Canada Basin. This plot <laughs> takes the difference between Grace bottom pressure and ISAP dynamic topography. It basically gives you sort of the, the average density and from which we've, we've converted that to uh, freshwater content. And what you find is that there's been a big increase, sure enough, in the freshwater content in the Beaufort Sea. And, uh, and this kind of is in line with that first uh, conclusion that we saw in the, in the recent report uh, for the Arctic uh, and Atlantic workshop. Uh, but what that also shows, this figure also shows, there's been a big decrease in the freshwater content in all the rest of the Arctic Ocean. And what we find if we add this all together is that basically there's been a very small change in the total freshwater content. The dominant signal is that we've shifted freshwater from the, the Russian side over into the Canadian Basin side. And we argue that a lot of that is due to the fact that we've been funneling for some time now, we've been funneling this water uh, that used to just go out of the Russian rivers and, and out Fram Strait. Now it's been getting funneled over into the Canada Basin. And, whoops, I've got the wrong, I've got the wrong slideshow here. Um, I'm gonna have to escape. I've been showing you the upload. And I want to show you this one.
we have one figure here, one or two figures, which are uh, in, uh, if not impressed, they're at least submitted, and we didn't want to have those go out on the web uh, permanently. But I can show them to you here. Okay, uh, what's happened recently? Uh, you know, since uh, 2008, have we been continuing to have this uh, cyclonic mode? Well, uh, Ron's uh, now developed a dynamic ocean topography for uh, Cryostat 2, and so these are figures uh, from a uh, paper that he just submitted, and it shows, uh, I think, basically, that we're still for all these periods, now he's got every four months from 2011 to 2014. And for all periods, the core of the Beaufort Gyre is, is southeast in the Beaufort Sea, uh, and a trough of low dynamic ocean topography extends along the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean, producing that, that cyclonic circulation there. And all these are hallmarks of the cyclonic mode. Uh, and a key element that you just can't observe in the in situ observations is the rising DOT towards the Russian coast. There's a downwelling circulation pattern, but the most important thing is that it, it means that you're ca still carrying that Eurasian River runoff over into the Canada Basin. Well, what's causing all this? Uh, I was really kind of surprised to find I mean, we thought we figured it out, but it turns out that the Russians had figured it out all before us. Uh, this is a page from uh, Sokolov's review paper. And he says, uh, basically, it is known that the Iceland low usually influences a vast territory of the ocean from Iceland to the new Siberian islands. So that's all along the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and the polar high, conversely, causes, and by polar high, what a, we would call that the Beaufort high, causes anticyclonic circulation of waters in the Canadian region of the Arctic Basin. In general, the conditions described prevail, basically, if, if, this, if this Icelandic low is strong, we get a cyclonic circulation. And if the polar high is strong, we get an anticyclonic circulation, is what he says. And the picture I've just flopped up there is from our 2012 paper, uh, but it's simply the, the uh, pressure pattern in the Arctic that's associated, that regresses with the Arctic oscillation. And what you see is that the low pressure pattern basically is kind of a fuzzy image of what, what uh, Sokolov Calls and it is called the uh, the uh, Icelandic low. So <clears throat> basically, hemispheric variability is characterized by the, the Arctic oscillation, and its pattern strengthens the Icelandic low and may weaken part of the Beaufort Beaufort or polar high. In modern terms, the cyclonic mode prevails when the AO is high. Well, how's the AO been? We've we've uh, often uh, heard that, well, the AO is declining. And, and of course, the problem is the AO uh, index varies a lot. Uh, but what I've plotted here is the AO index averaged over the winter months, uh, November through April. Uh, and I've, so I've just got a yearly value, basically, of the winter AO. And I've subtracted off the AO prior to 1988. And what we see is that, indeed, in, uh, in uh, 1989, uh, the AO reached a maximum. And then it relaxed to near uh, pre-1988 levels oh, around 2003. And then it rose back up. But the, the the main thing that I need to point out is that it, it's basically, for 20 years, if you look at the average AO, it's, it's one standard deviation above what it was prior to uh, 1989. So we've really 
there have been declines, and we try and figure out what happens when the ocean corresponding to those declines. There have been rises. We try and figure out what happens. But we're basically in an elevated AO state. So why does this matter? Well, first of all, climate models uh, suggest that AO will increase with global warming. So this is really kind of a taste of things to come. Uh, the high AO and cyclonic circulation is associated with a number of things, but among them is uh, warmer temperatures on the on the Russian side of the Arctic, and uh, and the circulation pattern associated with this cyclonic regime tends to spread the ice out and allow it to escape. A tight anticyclonic circulation like the Beaufort Gyre associated with that is a convergence of the ice, and so buoys that get put into the into the Beaufort Gyre can rattle around in the same general area going around and around for years. Uh, cyclonic gyre tends to basically expel the ice and, uh, and any buoys that you try and get in there. So the end result is you end up with a reduction in ice age, which means you get a reduction in thickness and a reduction in extent. If you're exposed to this continuing every winter, you get this cyclonic circulation. So I think it's got a lot to do with the, the changes we've seen in the ice. Also, the cyclonic circulation likely sends less fresh water through Fram Strait. All this runoff is going to the Canada Basin first, and more goes through the Canadian archipelago. So that's going to affect somehow, I'm not sure what it is, but it should be affecting the global overturning circulation, depending on how this is getting mixed out into the North Atlantic. Another thing that I kind of worry about is uh, the cyclonic circulation potentially brings Russian nuclear waste and other contaminants to Alaskan shores. Uh, in the early 90s, there was a big study uh, that we all participated in called N NWAP, the Arctic Nuclear Waste Assessment Program, and it was because there's so many dumped submarines and radioactive uh, uh, nuclear reactors and stuff that have been dumped in the Kara Sea. Uh, and there are also uh, giant nuclear waste reservoirs on the big watersheds. And at the time, uh, I think everybody determined with a bunch of surveys that, that the radionuclides in the Arctic Ocean were still predominantly due to a, a British uh, fuel reprocessing system, uh, Sellafield, and plus the, the impetus as far as uh, Alaska natives was concerned was kind of off because, well, most of that water would go out through Fram Strait. Well, the times have changed, and uh, if we're in this cyclonic mode, I think, uh, and these uh, reactors start to break down and the hulls of the submarines rust away, um, we're going to have, uh, have any contaminants showing up on our shores. Uh, there are some observational steps that uh, well, I think really the uh, most important one is to keep this great balance of in situ and remote sensing observations to give a full basin view and and work to make these comparisons between them. I mean, I think this, this uh, ability to get, for us, to get information from the satellites that covers the whole Arctic Ocean and be able to go out to ever more remote locales and get in situ observations and then combine those things. I mean, I think that's really the key to understanding what's going to be going on. And, and I have to say uh, that the agencies, I think, have been doing a terrific job of, of supporting the right things uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, there's some concern that we have high latitude satellite altimetry after, uh, after ISAT two goes up. I don't think there's anything scheduled, so I think uh, we hope that in the next decadal survey, which is going to start here soon, uh, we make sure we, we keep these, uh, these high-latitude <coughs> satellite missions going. And uh, we need to keep making and improving in situ measurement, uh, particularly those like the water chemistry that 
that infer events and processes that may be happening in some inaccessible region. And uh, we want to maintain and improve accessibility to all regions of the Arctic Ocean with diplomacy, new technology, and repurposing existing technology. And, uh, and kind of at this, these last two uh, little admonitions are, are really uh, what follows in a, in a prime example. Okay, so I'm kind of going to jump back, and we're going to focus in on the on the flight. Uh, yeah, what we, what we started to do uh, in 2005, we realized we were having a very difficult time getting into the Makarov Basin uh, to measure salinities there. Uh, but what we could do is the combination of North Pole, uh, Switchyard, and the NABOS project, we basically get a transarctic section that can do a good job of, of uh, analyzing the transpolar drift. So the transpolar drift basically at the North Pole is roughly headed towards Fram Strait, and we get a section that's perpendicular to that flow. We can look at the change in structure across the fronts, uh, associated with it, and this is a, a record of sections back to 2005 where we've done that, uh, and what we find is the Arctic Oscillation seems to affect basically the position of, of that core of that water that flows along the transpolar drift, and a positive AO shifts the axis uh, to Canada, so basically it kind of shoves um, the axis because you've inserted this cyclonic gyre on the Russian side, you end up shoving the transpolar drift farther towards Alaska. And that and that shows up in these in these sections uh, across the the 90 west, 90 east line. Okay, so unfortunately we want to continue this, but unfortunately in April of 2015, North Pole uh, NPEO missed the three central stations across the transpolar drift. We had a terrible weather uh, with windstorms and constantly digging out of, of the windstorms. And so <clears throat> usually we kind of save the closest uh, stations to the Russian base camp uh, for last. And uh, we got the extreme stations, some down the switchyard side and uh, at, down uh, 90 west and all the way down to 85 on 90 east, but, but then the weather kind of closed in and we never got back to the North Pole, which is, is relatively close. I think I can sh indicate the, the Borneo station uh, where we base out of was about there, so we were very, we were very close. We were about 40 miles from the pole at that point. Um, and the station there may help us with this data problem, but anyway, we didn't get all we wanted. So. Uh, and this other problem is that uh, we would have loved to, over the years, get sections across the Makarov Basin, and uh, basically it's just logistically too hard. But but the ONR-sponsored Scissors Project uh, gave us the experience to, to realize that, well, maybe we could get these things with the, with the Coast Guard planes. And, uh, and if we could do that, it really expands the observational horizon, how far you can go and what you can do and what time of year you can do it, uh, uh, really improves if we, could, if we could really extend those operations. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the ONR-sponsored uh, seasonal ice zone reconnaissance surveys. Uh, the seasonal ice zone, as you probably all know, is the region between between maximum extent and minimum extent. And with the big decreases in summer ice extent in recent years, uh, that seasonal ice zone has gotten a lot bigger, uh, particularly over in the Canada side. Uh, during the 2012 record minimum sea ice extent uh, marked a massive reduction in the multi-year ice and the expansion of the Pacific side uh, seasonal ice zone. So how do we track that? Well, the scissors goal is to understand and predict that, that evolution, and this requires uh, repeat sections of the atmosphere, the ice, and the ocean, really all through the melt season from, from late spring and into fall. And 
these uh, Coast Guard Arctic Domain Awareness Flights provide a perfect opportunity. Uh, and what we do is we fly out in a C-130 and we drop expendable probes. And in this case, I'm showing this flying from the open water part of the seasonal ice zone in the C-130, typically at low level. Um, and uh, we drop AXCTDs, which is an aircraft expendable CTD, and AXCPs, which are aircraft expendable current probes. We also drop uh, buoys, various kinds. This shows an up-tempo buoy, uh, which has a little tail that measures the upper ocean temperature. And it stays in the ice and, and uh, transmits its data back through the satellite system. The uh, XCP and AXCTD all are data that we pick up on the way. Let me back up. Well, I'm sorry, we plunged ahead. Uh, this shows an example of, uh, of one of the drops. These guys are dropping AXCTDs and AXCPs out the back of the airplane. And this is always kind of exciting. We, you'll see we're dropping it in an open lead, so it takes a fair bit of marksmanship to find, find an open patch sometimes. Uh, quite a bit of uh, skill on the part of the aviators. There's a surface buoy that, that drops Whoops. Well, let me go back and do this part. Uh, when we return, go south uh, across the seasonal ice zone, then we drop uh, atmospheric drop songs. Along the way, we also are, are using some uh, uh, infrared uh, imagers, cameras, and, uh, and in recent times, we've, uh, we're now approved to use a, a little LIDAR that uh, folks from University of Colorado put out, put on the plane, go back to where we were. Once we uh, get this probe in the water, the surface float drops an instrument through the, through the water, tailing a really fine wire. The fine wire sends data from the CTD or current probe back up to the surface buoy, and it transmits the data on a VHF radio link back to the airplane. We take it in through one of the aircraft antennas, and we sit at a table and here our buddy Roger Anderson is sitting there recording the data. So it takes about 10 minutes to record one of these profiles and they're typically down to about 1,000 meters. And that's an example of a AXCTE cast that was made in uh, May uh, 30, 2012. And the, the, the important thing here is that when we go out in May in the C-130, the Coast Guard guys, um, there are no other ships around. There's nobody out doing oceanographic measurements. I mean, we're getting a picture of what the conditions are before the, the melt starts. And so it's really something that gives you initial conditions for a model so that you can then perhaps improve your predictions of how much the ice is gonna, gonna melt back. Uh, but the, the access you get at this early period for the ships can go in there is a tremendous advantage. Anyway, so in the course of all this, of course, uh, we're thinking about these other problems we have, and and, and we've talked to, uh, never been able to see the Makarov Basin, so uh, I approached uh, some of our aviators at, up at Coast Guard Station uh, Kodiak, and we've talked about a plan to, to make a longer flight. Let's see if we could, could we do a flight with one of these C-130s out into the Makarov Basin and go to the North Pole and, and maybe rest overnight at Alert or uh, Thule and then come back. Could we, could we do that? And, and so they, they worked up a sketchy sort of plan to do that, uh, and it's actually something that we propose now that we add this to the North Pole Environmental Observatory uh, activities is to go out, this would be in the summertime, but go out and make uh, a section across the Carl Basin. Well, and then the, uh, this year, of course, we, we didn't get our stations, uh, three stations that we wanted to get at the, in the, uh, across the transpolar drift. And so we went back to the same folks back up at Kodiak and said, ah, do you suppose we could do this? Kind of test out the whole system by uh, flying up to uh, the North Pole, basically, doing three CTD stations 
and then and then getting home. And they they really took this uh, project to heart, and they went through a number of scenarios, flying down to Thule, resting overnight and everything. But they finally came up with this scheme, which was in a lot of ways very efficient. Um, it was basically to just uh, fly from Kodiak to Barrow, rest overnight, and then fly up and do the mission and fly right back. And so this was kind of the the, the most economical in terms of uh, people's time and and uh, and arranging accommodations and all that kind of thing. But anyway, so the idea was that um, we'd fly up, uh, and it's about uh, 1,200 nautical miles up to the pole region. 1,200 miles back with 120 miles of distance between those stations. Uh, we would launch uh, AXCTDs and AXCPs at the, at, the, at, the, at the sites near the North Pole and drop a, an atmospheric drop sonde at the North Pole for profiles of atmospheric temperature and other properties, uh, and deploy an uh, airborne expendable ice beacon or AXID buoy for the International Arctic Buoy Program, funded by the, the Navy NOAA National Ice Center. The whole, the other part of this was just to test the feasibility of making such a long-range flight uh, with a Coast Guard uh, aircraft over an area which really they hadn't done this sort of a long-range flight before, in which, uh, you know, the conditions, the, the MET reports that we could get little different. And uh, so then a big part of this became, well, how do we get meteorology uh, basically to plan the flight and the operation? And, and the Coast Guard guys found uh, something that I guess they hadn't used too much before, which is an Air Force site that, that does a pretty good job of the in route planning. Uh, and National Weather Service does a good job of doing things like terminal forecasts. In other words, what's the where they're going to be like at Barrow when you get back. But then to do our operation out on the ice, uh, we really need to also know what it's like down low. And so uh, Martin uh, arranged for this. Uh, the uh, Naval Research Laboratory as part of, of ONR uh, was producing a experimental product to give to the Coast Guard, the Healy, uh, for their operation, which was going on at the same time, and so we started picking up that and giving that to the to, to our Coast Guard uh, aviators. And this shows uh, shows us kind of getting ready for the flight uh, preparations in Kodiak. Uh, and Lieutenant Atherton was our aircraft commander, and he uh, he really did a lot of the preliminary uh, well coming up with plans to do all of these long-range North Pole Environmental Observatory-related flights. And Lieutenant D'Angelo, the first officer, uh, took responsibility for a lot of the details uh, leading up to this. So, so these guys put a tremendous amount of effort kind of over and above their normally busy schedules and their flight duties to, to plan this thing. And it, it really kind of typifies what we found with the Coast Guard station up there, uh, the people are just tremendous. I mean, they just get into this and uh, they'll do amazing things to try and get the mission completed. And they take a real personal interest. They come in on Sunday and load the plane and and feed us and all kinds of stuff. It's just a, a really great uh, example of work of uh, team teamwork. Uh, this just shows us kind of loading up. Uh, this is the AXID buoy. It's a, it's a buoy that has this big yellow cone that you see on the left side. It's laying on its side here. And you'll, you'll kind of see how that works in the next following picture. And on the right, we have, it's Jim Johnson, uh, who's uh, doing this work for Ignatius Rigger of the International Arctic Buoy Program. And on the right, we have Sarah Dewey, my graduate student, who's also listening in. And so uh, we all should clap because Sarah's listening. And uh, and Roger Anderson, who really is the expert behind getting this uh, data back from these expendable probes. Uh, this shows a picture on the left of looking aft in the cargo bay of the aircraft. Uh, Sarah, Roger, and uh, 
and Jim are back there. And then on the right, uh, Jason Mathney, and he is a contractor for NOAA uh, Earth Systems Research Laboratory in Boulder. And what has in front of him is a uh, is a uh, gas sampler, basically. And and so that instrument flew on the flight, and uh, it's a NOAA NOAA function, and uh, they're measuring. CO2, methane, uh, basically all the chemicals constituents of the atmosphere. And they were commonly partnered up with them when we do our scissors flight. So we're, we're not just doing uh, oceanography and, and dry atmospheric uh, observations. We're also looking at the atmospheric uh, chemical constituents. Looking forward, you see uh, uh, Abel and Ramstead are our basic airmen on the flight, and, and Brian Ramstead is our drop master. And that's another example. Uh, Ramstead is uh, coming in on Sunday to load the plane, reload the plane, figure out how to get all this stuff on board, and, and most importantly, how to drop things out the back. And uh, so you'll see them in action here in a second. This is the Air Force product that uh, aviators use to plan the flight. and. Uh, the important thing to them was knowing the, the wind velocity at the flight level. So it's kind of they're looking up at flight level uh, 2208 or 2236, as illustrated there on the right. And uh, so they want to know the wind velocity, how that's going to affect their range. And they also want to know the temperature because they didn't want it to get uh, too cold. At a certain point, uh, the fuel starts to gel in the, in the airplane, and they, that would be a bad thing. So. That was uh, perfect for their uh, in-route planning. This figure on the left shows uh, basically the ceiling height in the area of operation. And you'll see it's a little unfortunate that uh, up there in where we operate, and there's a little red dog leg in the arrow, and somehow the, the arrow has gotten shifted down. But these, uh, these uh, stations that we were doing, we're kind of under a cloud cover. Uh, if we'd been doing stations on 90 West, uh, we would have had clear skies. But it, it, from this forecast, it was projected not to be uh, too bad. I mean, it was a you know a thousand foot uh, ceiling or something like that. Uh, it actually, in a lot of areas, was a little worse. Uh, but the general picture is is pretty good. So I'm, I'm we were all pretty impressed with both the Air Force and the and the NRL uh, forecast, and we need to do a more uh, quality, quantitative uh, comparison with, with what we finally found. But this one on the right is uh, is kind of the sad story. And I guess if I if I had done my planning better, uh, it wouldn't have been so sad. But you can see that right around the area that we wanted to study, I'm going to use my cursor. Our stations were located here here and here that we wanted to hit. And unfortunately, those were below freezing. Almost everywhere else is slightly above freezing. And the result of that was there were plenty of leads that were open that we could draw probes in, but the leads in this area all had slush. And, and unfortunately, our probes don't work very well uh, in slush. Okay, so here's, I'll show you a launch, and this is pretty neat. This was actually at the North Pole. Um, and uh, Abel and Ranstead are there on the on the ramp of that plane. The, the ramp is down and the door is is up, and they're they're strapped in. But they've got the axid buoy and they're ready to roll it out of the, the airplane. And in this case, we've been searching for places where the slush was thin, and we found this one slot where it was not so bad. And you can see the kind of smoother gray ice. And the exit buoy went uh, beyond that, but it uh, it still went into the ice and it penetrated the slush. Uh, what you see at the very end of this of this drop is kind of interesting. The yellow capsule that's kind of on the top, uh, watch it carefully, and after it goes in the water, almost instantly, uh, it pops off. And there, it flopped off. And, and when that flops off, it's on a timer. 
And if you drop from too high, it's bad because that comes off and the parachute releases and you can drop it too far. But in this case, it was just right. Just as it landed, it, it released the, the yellow hat and the parachute fell off. And then there's a, a mass that kind of spring loaded and it pops up. And so we get the, the temperature and the pressure. Uh, well, the temperature is the main thing. The temperature at two meters. So it's a kind of a standard. Now I want to go on to the next. Oh, okay. Here they're going back to the same slot. And we say, well, try and put it in that thin spot again. And you can see that one of the probes actually hit the really thin ice, the really thin slush. And uh, that was that was uh, Mr. Abel's uh, probe. And he was kind of given uh, Ranstead the business there. Okay, well, anyway, the sampling outcomes. We reached uh, the three stations as planned, and the science equipment all worked, all the things that we had on board. Um, the slush at the lead surface is, was, was our biggest problem, and, uh, and it prevented the AXCTDs and XCPs from functioning properly. Now, the AXCTD and AXCP, we were dropping at 88 north and 90 east. Uh, those worked. Uh, the slush was not quite as bad there. Uh, but the ones at 89 and 90 uh, north didn't didn't work. Um, what happens is they go in the water and the, the probe and buoy have to kind of flip over. And I think basically if there's too much slush, this flipping over process doesn't work, and the AXCD is sits there in the sits there in the slush. Uh, the drops on the atmospheric drops on the cameras and the air ke air chemistry sampling worked, so that takes care of. Um, uh, the chemistry sampling takes care of the, the NOAA folks that are down in Boulder. Uh, the axid buoy uh, deployed just as it was supposed to, and it's still transmitting the two meter air temperature and uh, surface air pressure. We hope to make up the missing hydro data from uh, CTD data, maybe from the geotraces crews. They, they got to the pole, I think, about two weeks after we were there. Uh, we also can try using interpolation among the stations that we did get. We, it's great that we got 88. That'll help us do an interpolation. Uh, we have the one at Borneo, and we have 89 north and 90 west. So we can get something just doing interpolation. And then uh, I wanted to bring NASA back into the picture. We also can look at dynamic ocean topography from, from Cryosat 2, and this shows a comparison on the left between dynamic height measured by uh, NPEO and dynamic topography interpolated from, from Cryosat 2. And we can get velocities from that uh, maps of dynamic ocean topography and compare those to ice drifts. So there's a couple of other things. Again, bringing in the, the products from other agencies, in this case, um, NASA and NOAA help us fill in the, the gap. Uh, conclusion. So slush at lead surface is our biggest problem and will be prevented in the future by scheduling these sorts of flights that go north of 80 north. We need to be at least two weeks earlier in the season. I've since learned about the climatology, and it looks like we were at the very end of the period where temperatures above 80 north, at 80 north and higher uh, are, are above freezing. Uh, more importantly, I think the long-range deployment of buoys uh, and these kinds of probes by these uh, C-130H uh, aircraft, the Coast Guard's plane, uh, it's absolutely feasible, uh, and but it really does require the support of, the, of course, the Coast Guard, uh, NSF, ONR, NOAA, and the Air Force. I mean, if we hadn't had all these elements, uh, you couldn't have done this flight. You couldn't. Have, done it successful. Anyway, so again, I just want to thank everybody, uh, all the agencies for, as far as I'm concerned, they've been doing the right stuff um, for 15 years, and it's made made things really exciting for me and uh, the people I'm working with. So anyway, thank you. Sorry it took so long. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Um, much appreciate your presentation. It's, uh, as you say, a good good example of when agencies uh, work together to help the scientists 
to do the important work that people like you do, then it just shows that we uh, we can get things done in the Arctic. And I think we're getting more done than we're often given credit for. Um, and I think we have to do more to raise awareness of what is actually being done so that um, there is less criticism of the apparent lack of the US government uh, doing things in the Arctic. Um, we're over time, but I'd like to give, um, there are still 31 people uh, registered and online. So if there are any questions for Jamie, uh, let's uh, make good use of the time. Uh, this is Renee Crane at NSF, and I wanted to thank you, Jamie, for the presentation and um, point out that one of the motivations for inviting you was to also show how our research community integrates across the agencies to make best and most efficient use of opportunities as well. So thanks for highlighting that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it, and, that, and, I, and I agree with the concern that I, I don't think that this uh, – this interagency activity gets gets enough credit, um, and, and I think there's a tendency in our community to uh, sort of silo our thinking. You know, if we're doing one kind of measurement, working for one kind of agency, um, there's a little bit of a tendency. I think it's natural to to think only in terms of that, and to not. Uh, really go out and take advantage of all the other things that are going on and that are applicable. So I think, and I think that this uh, webinar business with, uh, that we're doing right now, I'm really impressed. This is a great idea. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think it will really pay off. Any more, any questions, comments for Jamie? Yeah, this is Simon at NSF. Um, Jamie, how close to the limit on the loiter time at the North Pole were you guys? Were, would you have been able to do, uh, you know, twice as many drops if you had needed to do twice as many drops, or were you really at the limit? <laughs> well, well, as a matter of fact, uh, Sarah sees me smiling. We did twice as many <laughs> drops. We kept trying to. Uh, we kept trying to uh, get probes to work in that slush. So for every every station, we did at least two tries. Um, okay. You know, on average, um, you know, I think we probably did three tries at the at the North Pole area, and it. Uh, so yeah, we had a, and that that kind of uh, difficulty of finding a place that was clear of as clear as possible, uh, kind of stretch things. We didn't, we used all our time. I'll say that. Uh, yep. I think the, the aircraft uh, carries 65,000 pounds of fuel and the plan was to return with 15,000 pounds of fuel. It, it, uh, it, uh, got overhead at Barrow with 15,000 pounds. And that's, that's good for probably three hours more flying, but uh, nobody likes to land with, uh, with less than that. Yep. And, uh, an interesting part of the picture I didn't show was, uh, and it showed up nicely in the NRL meteorology, it was really a strong little cyclone uh, in the Beaufort Sea, and I think it was hammering the uh, hammering the Healy uh, as it was trying to get up to the pole. <laughs> But we fortunately kind of screwed off to the side of it in our flight path. But when we got back to uh, Barrow, uh, that storm had really kicked up the waves, and we we ended up uh, staying, you know, at the, at, through the arrangements of Renee, stayed out at the old Gnarl site, uh, and uh, the waves were so bad they were they were washing the road away. So we. Ended up having to come back. We stayed there that night, and uh, and then we had to evacuate uh, because uh, the road was washing out. It was uh, was pretty impressive. Anyway, that got, got, gets me off the subject, but uh, I thought it was pretty cute. Thank you.
Amy, this is Renee from the National Weather Service, Alaska region. Um, I'd ask Jessica uh, whether or not the AXIV is, you said it was still operating. Is it transmitting data in real time via the global telecommunication system? Yeah, I, I think so. Okay. Um, and then right, just yeah. a, a, a suggestion. I know we were sort of pulled in just before y'all were heading up to uh, right. Barrow, and so we weren't in a position to provide you with the services and support that, that uh, we had discussed on our telecon. I might suggest that perhaps um, we uh, have such a telecon for your next uh, experiment well in advance so that we can be sure you get the products and services that you and your U U.S. Coast Guard colleagues need. And we are going to enter into a discussion with the U.S. Coast Guard and develop uh, uh, some sort of a memorandum of understanding, a CONOPS, uh, as we recognize that folks um, rotate uh, in and out of positions there uh, at Kodiak. And so we're hoping that the, um, um, the issues of not knowing how to access the data will be resolved. Right. We, uh, yeah, and thank you. Uh, the, uh, I think we also talked about having uh, Somebody come up, maybe go on one of the scissors flights. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think all the pieces are there, but uh, these uh, operations like this, or just our regular scissors flight, really would be an opportunity to, to make a lot of connections that uh, that would help the folks down there in Kodiak. Well, we're certainly happy to engage with you. So let's have uh, another telecon well in advance of your next flight. Okay, sounds good. Okay, unless there's anything further for Jamie, I'd like to move on quickly and just close out the agenda. Um, so one final word, anyone any comments or questions for Jamie? No? Okay, well, thanks again, Jamie. I really appreciate the comprehensive overview you gave. And as I said at the beginning when I introduced you and uh, Renee followed up when you finished that what you're doing exemplifies how some PIs make the interagency effort look good uh, through the efforts of, at the investigator level. And uh, we reap the benefits of that 